My name is Joanne Greenlee. I'm the mental health navigator for the school district of Marshfield and the co-chair for the mental health task force for Macy. Um, welcome to our Let's Keep Talking series. Um, today we're going to have Ariel Andrew, who's from the LEO program, talk to us about the impact of the Hello. I'm Ariel from the LEO program. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to jump in with a poll just to see and get a feel for how social media influences our own lives really quick. So by a show of hands, how many of you own a cell phone? On your cell phone, how many of you have an app for a social media platform? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and it, right? Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, how many of you use your social media app at least once a day? Keep your hand up if it's more than once a day. Yeah, okay. Now I have a feeling, I have a question for you. How do you, have you ever noticed how you feel when you open your social media app? How does it feel to like grab your phone and check it? Better than not being able to grab your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you maybe feel like a little bit of a sense of relief when yes. you can access it? Yes. Okay, okay. How how do you feel when you don't have access to it all of a sudden? Lost. Lost. That's good. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you feel if you get a notification? I have all my notifications turned off, so I don't know. That's good. All. That's good. I appreciate that. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, it depends. Well, it depends on the notification. Yeah, what does it depend on? Well, if it's just like a junk mail notification, <laughs> whatever. Okay, no big deal. You kind of feel bothered when you see those. Mm, yeah, but if it's a notification like a text message or Snapchat or something like that, you feel excited. You feel excited? Okay. Yeah. A little interested? Intrigued? Yeah. yeah, okay. What were you going to say? Uh, delete them all. <laughs> okay, yeah. Maybe overwhelmed. Maybe maybe there's so I, many of them you don't want to see them. I don't even use Facebook and it comes up on my phone all the time and I just delete, delete, delete. Yeah, so maybe sometimes our notifications can feel Once a little intrusive. Out how to delete Facebook, I probably <laughs> Good. There, yeah, there you go. Right, right. We're thinking long term now. This is good. This is good. We're adults, so it's easier for our brains to think long term, right? Because our prefrontal cortex, this part of our brain that helps us think long term, has already developed. But in our youth, this part of our brain, this prefrontal cortex, higher brain part that helps us think long term and understand how we feel during different environments or different actions, still is in the development process. And so what science tells us is that social media really influences the way that our youth's brains develop. And I've got a short video to explain why this is. I'm hoping it'll be the right next one. If scrolling through your social media feed feels like a drug you can't get away from, that's because it kind of is. When something makes you feel good, your brain responds by producing a chemical called dopamine. Drinking alcohol, smoking a cigarette, seeing someone you love, all of that equals dopamine. Getting a like on your Facebook post, yep, that produces dopamine too. Back when humans looked more like Geico cavemen, our brains started developing with a pack mentality. Meaning if everyone in the pack likes you, your brain responds one way. And if everyone in the pack votes you off the island, your brain responds in a different way. Fast forward to today, your Instagram feed is where your friends tell you they like your girlfriend, approve of your outfit. That approval gives you dopamine, which is why 10 seconds after you close the app, your instinct is to open it again. So before you lay in bed at night scrolling through photos, remember that your brain is wired to think that likes on Insta are just as important as someone liking you in real life. <laughs> Great example of how technology gets very yes. bright and very um, noise oriented as well, right? Oh and we'll get, in, we'll get into a little bit of that in just a second. <laughs> There. 
Can I the next one? Yeah. There perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So in the Leo program, we teach about two large chunks of our brain. Now, our brain is a very complex structure. This is honestly a very oversimplification of it. But I talked a little bit to you about the higher brain, which is our ability to rationalize and see long term. It also helps us see the big picture and really start understanding and identifying what action I take that leads to a specific type of feeling in my body. In adults, your prefrontal cortex, your higher brain, is already developed. In women, it tends to finish developing around the age of 25. In men, it's a little bit longer, and it's about until the age of 27. This has to do with hormones primarily, the different hormone levels in our brain that influence um, brain development. However, in our youth, their lower brain, which is the home of our survival instincts and our fight, flight, and freeze response, their lower brains are the primary part of their brain that is leading and guiding their decision-making process. As Geico Cave people, in the times when we first started really truly evolving as human beings, our lower brains started to learn that connection to other humans was the safest thing for us, right? That pack mentality, right? If you were a cave person, did you have a very good chance of survival if you were kicked out of your tribe and made to survive the winter alone? No, not at all, right? So we have, especially in youth, whose lower brains are you know, so much significantly stronger than their higher brains because of where they're at developmentally, their need for connection really guides a lot of their decision making. And as we've learned from our video, the way that social media has been built, it's designed to interact with our brain to force the production of dopamine, which is our reward giving neurotransmitter, which adds to that feeling of happiness and excitement and joy and reward that we receive when we get a notification or a like from someone that we know or from somebody on social media, because it's rewarding our action for being socially engaging especially in the teen brain, especially in the teen brain, the amygdala, which is the alarm bell, activates very strongly for the dopamine loop. And we'll get into the dopamine loop in a little bit. However, in the adult brain, because our prefrontal cortex is fully developed, we have a better ability to regulate the alarms that our amygdala, which is over here, is starting to generate and cause action. Are you with me so far? Okay, excellent. Okay, excellent. So my, I, have a, I have a question for you in general. Do we think self-esteem is important? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Right. Do we agree, do we disagree? Especially for teenagers. Especially for teenagers, especially for teenagers. Why, what is self-esteem? It's how you feel about yourself. It's how you feel about yourself. Do we think how we feel about ourselves is important? Yeah. It's who we are. It's who we are. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. And science would say the same because how we feel about ourselves is really representative of how connected we are to ourselves. And as we've learned, connection is something that our lower brain believes is vital to our survival. Without safe connections to ourselves and connections to others, our fight, flight, freeze, survival instincts take control, and it forces us to take actions which increase our dopamine production, increase that reward that we're gaining, right? What influences our self-esteem? Like, what others say about us? Yeah, or what we accomplish. What others say about us, what we accomplish. So if I post 15 posts in a day, I'm accomplishing a lot. Should I feel pretty good about myself? You may. If what? If people like them. <laughs> if people like them. Yeah, yeah. Now, social media is a vast global network. Um, are people kind on social media? Not always and not often, right? Bullying is one of the major problems on social media and greatly influences mental health, especially in the developing brain, because it really influences our self-esteem and how we feel about ourselves. So in Leo, we've really tried hard to flip the narrative for our youth, to give them back a little bit more power about how they feel about themselves so that they can learn to connect deeply and truly with their authentic beings 
and not rely on external judgments of other people to base how they feel and can connect to themselves. So in Leo, we say your self-esteem is basing your value only on external factors. I get good grades, I feel good about myself. I get 16 likes on the post that I posted, I feel good about myself. Somebody reshares my post or comments on my post in a positive way, I feel really good about myself. But if we rely on our self-esteem and therefore the comments or likes of other people on social media to connect to ourselves and our own interests and our own hobbies and our own worlds, we don't have very much control over how we feel about ourselves or how we're connecting to ourselves. In fact, we're relying on the dopamine we receive from other people to be rewarded for growing as an individual. This creates a lot of mental health concerns because then we're growing and developing the way that other people are praising us for doing so, which is very mixed messaging. If you grow up in a household that doesn't approve of social media or doesn't engage with you with your social media use as a teen, but then you enter in high school and all of your friends think that TikTok is the coolest thing ever. And if you don't have TikTok, you aren't a part of the social crowd, right? It creates this really big um, disconnection from a youth and their own selves and the technological world and the real time world. And it creates a lot of stress, which releases a lot of cortisol, which is our stress hormone in our body. And when your body releases a lot of cortisol and has a lot of stress, your lower brain starts to activate because it feels that the connection we need for survival in our society is something that we don't have. So we teach our youth that in fact, self-worth is incredibly important. Your self-worth is knowing and believing that you have value solely because you exist on the planet. And this value does not change based on external factors. It does not change because you wear the coolest clothes or the least cool clothes. It doesn't change if you get a brand new pair of sneakers every school year or you wear the same pair of sneakers until your feet outgrow them. It doesn't change if you have a job. It doesn't change if you get a D. It doesn't change if you have an emotional outburst in class and you're sent to the principal's office because your actions don't define your value. But your actions do inform how other people see and recognize your value. We know this because of the dopamine loop that occurs in our brain. So we engage with social media. We're performing a direct action. If we get interact, right, this is a write, a share, a post, a comment, any kind of direct action on social media produces dopamine in our brain. The moment you look or check your screen and you see that notification, your brain is rewarded with dopamine, right? But then you put down your phone and your brain is not actively receiving that dopamine production any longer. Because again, the way that technology has been designed is to release dopamine the moment you engage with it. It's because of the way that technology engages different parts of your brain. Right? But real life doesn't engage the same parts of your brain. And so me standing up here in front of you doesn't produce instantaneous dopamine as me checking my phone does. So if a youth becomes stressed out or uncomfortable in real time, but then they have a whole world on their phone that produces a lot of instantaneous dopamine, very suddenly that world in their phone becomes a lot safer for them because it's producing rapidly larger and larger amounts of dopamine that real time engagement doesn't produce. Now this is problematic because then we're waiting for the reaction of the reward. And in this span of we've written a post, we've checked, we've gotten dopamine, we've put the phone down and now we're waiting, our brain starts to release cortisol. It starts to stress us out. And this stress pushes us to seek out more dopamine where we're rewarded for our actions, where we're rewarded for engaging with that technology. And this is the dangerous and addictive dopamine loop. Science has very clearly now told us that technology Social media, video games, and TV, movies, all of those things are just as addictive as alcohol and nicotine and cocaine and all of the other substances that we want our youth to stay away from. And yet we have embedded social media into our society. COVID only made this worse. We were encouraged to engage through social media. And our youths, especially at the age that a lot of them were at when COVID hit, 
their brains now learned that the safest, most reliable way to get dopamine is through connecting and engaging on social media, not in real time. Because they grew up in a four year span of time, a three and a half, four year span of time where engaging in real life was dangerous and highly stressful and highly unpredictable. Okay? All of those things, those unpredictability, the danger, the uncertainty, the stress, activates the lower brain producing cortisol, pushing them to seek out the safety of social media and the dopamine reward that they get so quickly from that use. But how do we how do we beat that? Order? Yeah, how do we fix it? <laughs> how this about <laughs> kids have to be twenty one before they can get a phone like their drinking age? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that could work to an extent. However, we have schools now that give our youth tablets, mm -hmm. yeah. and youth are highly intelligent, and they honestly break through a lot of the firewalls that schools set up, and oh, so they yeah. download a lot of social media pro profiles on their school tablets, and it's really hard for parents and teachers to mod moderate that. On a regular basis right mm -hmm. so we have to so much more actively help our youth seek out dopamine in really healthy positive real-time ways in order to create strong pathways for delayed gratification right think about how instant and quick it is to pick up your phone and get that dopamine or video games too especially yeah. video game yeah especially if they can communicate with their friends uh -huh. while they're playing uh -huh. Uh -huh. um out of my four boys that I got, uh, I have two of them that doesn't, they don't have phones. They just have it when I give it to them. Yeah. Otherwise they don't have the phone, but they're on video games the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with your brain. Their brains it's are getting addicted the to the dopamine of it's the video just game. the whole generation. I mean, yep. yeah, how do you fix it? I, I, I don't know. I, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. They're, right? they're so into all the technology and stuff. That... Mm -hmm. It's because of the way technology was designed. It was designed to engage our youth. It's designed to be rewarding. It, re it reminds me of another class that I took that um, the instructor said, there's only two um, things that would call you a user, software and drug dealers. So, yeah. which is so true. Yeah. Because it's the same interaction in our brain, yeah. chemically. It's producing the same type of dopamine. So the moment you pick up your phone, it's releasing dopamine. The moment you set it down, your brain starts releasing cortisol, right? The moment that you pick up a cigarette and start inhaling, your brain is releasing dopamine. The moment that that cigarette is gone, your brain starts releasing cortisol. The cortisol is what pushes you to seek out the easiest form of dopamine that you can get. So our job as parents and guardians and adults that work with these youth is to start actively teaching them the reward of delayed gratification, because this is what produces really strong, solid pathways and connections from the lower brain, which is instinct, to the higher brain, which is conscious thought, right? So we have to be rewarding our youth for actions that they take that involve absolutely no social media. And social media cannot be a reward for actions that they're doing because then it's just hooking them to it again, right? Social media is a tool. Do you need to go to sleep with your hammer? Sometimes. Uh, Sometimes, <laughs> right? But again, are you making that decision out of a survival-based instinct to sleep with your hammer to protect yourself if somebody comes in your house, right? It's a stress-based response that you're creating ease in your brain because you're increasing positive happy hormones, which is dopamine, right? So happy, let me check my one, next slide. Ways to improve, improve yeah, huh, words, ways to improve and increase our self-worth in real time. And improving your self-worth is how you improve youth connection to themselves and enhance that delayed gratification release of dopamine rather than the instant gratification release of dopamine, which is what social media does, which is what we don't want in our youth, right? We don't want this in anyone. Instant gratification is not as healthy as delayed gratification. Think of it almost as like poisonous dopamine that's creating these really unhealthy feedback loops in our brain that create really unhealthy patterns of behavior, right? Because we're rewarded for our behavior when our brain releases dopamine. Number one, encourage basic self-care. Encourage self-compassion, both by modeling that behavior from, from you towards yourselves and also towards your youth, right? We also need to be encouraging positive self-talk. Positive self-talk is one of the best ways to improve a youth's felt 
self-worth, right? We can tell them that they have value as a human being, but if every time their grades drop, we're coming at them with a punishment instead of support, their self-talk becomes highly negative. So instead of the question being, I know you can do better, why did you get a D? The question could become, I see that, I see that your grades have dropped. What can I do to support you right now? Take the phone away. <laughs> but that's that works again, good if they get an F. But that's a punishment, right? So yeah, we're but it meeting, motivates them like you wouldn't believe. Well, to an extent. And we have to be really careful with negative motivation because it, again, creates, it has the capacity of creating that negative feedback loop in the brain, mm -hmm. right? And so if we're negatively punishing them for something that they're naturally going to feel guilty or bad about, we are actually promoting them to seek out the fastest, easiest form of dopamine, right? So as soon as your youth goes to school, who's to say they're not borrowing a friend's phone or a friend's tablet and engaging in their social media platforms in a way that you don't know because they're afraid of a consequence that they're gonna get if they're honest or truthful or vulnerable with that, right? Vulnerability and honesty grow self-worth and it's difficult. It's lower brain triggering for every single human to be vulnerable and to be honest because we risk losing connections when we are truly ourselves. But it is also the only way that you grow genuine connection. When you display honesty and when you display vulnerability and when you model that behavior to your youth. This is really important because all of our brains have these things called mirror neurons. Think of the idea of like monkey see, monkey do, right? I'm gonna watch a monkey eat a banana and really enjoy that banana. My mirror neurons then learn that if I eat a banana, I'm really going to enjoy that banana. And I want to enjoy that banana. I want to feel the enjoyment that I see that other monkey getting. So I'm going to start eating that banana, right? Our youth watch other youths engage with social media, but they also watch us engage with social media. So when you sit around the dinner table, that would be a great opportunity to say, okay, no phones at the dinner table, including right. mine, right? I'm going to put all of the technology in a bucket. After dinner, you can go and you can pick it up again. But during dinner, we're going to have family time. We're going to actively engage why we make decisions. We're going to have conversations about the stress we experience in our day, about the decision-making process that we undergo, about the emotions that we feel. Because dopamine produces that happy, reward, pleasure feeling. Right? Our neurochemicals structure the emotional response that we experience. And so when we get to the why, behind our actions and our decisions, we start identifying the emotion and identifying the cause and therefore understanding if we're actually experiencing a lot of stress, which is gonna push us to seek out more dopamine, or if we're experiencing a lot of boredom, which is gonna push us to seek out more dopamine, right? When we're highly engaged in our lives and we're able to meet small active steps and goals, our brain will produce small active amounts of dopamine regularly creating really, really healthy, strong pathways to positive thinking, which helps to regulate our stress hormones. Can you give some examples of that? Yeah, of what specifically? Of, of the small steps that they might take, the small little things that yeah. would be rewarding that yeah. can build those strong pathways. Yeah, absolutely. So anytime we complete a task, our brain will release dopamine. So really small steps, insisting that your youth have a morning self-care routine and an evening self-care routine. Now, again, this takes time to build up dopamine release, but it will. Every morning when they wake up, they have to brush their teeth, they have to wipe their face off with a washcloth, right? Finishing those tasks that they know they're responsible for will create dopamine release. Same thing at night. Your expectation is that you put your phone in a different room at night before you go to sleep, right? We know that that's healthy for our brains. We shouldn't sleep with technology around us, right? You've put your phone away, positively comment and speak about that with your youth. That's going to produce a reward in their brain because then you are positively engaging with them, creating this connection that they are naturally driven at this age to really seek out and focus on, right? Make sure they brush their teeth. Make sure they're drinking enough water. Um, what are some other good ones? Make sure that they're finishing their homework and celebrate that because it's difficult in today's society to have the attention span and the focus to complete a full assignment, especially when we're teaching them through technology to have really short attention spans, right? Think video games, right? Think how quick a TikTok video is, right? Technology teaches short attention spans. So the moment you see that attention span growing 
And you can even give them small tasks to start with and then increase the length of the task over time to build that attention span gradually, right? But anything that engages genuine, authentic, real-time connection releases dopamine. Playing a game all together as a family will release dopamine. Telling jokes all together as a family releases dopamine. Eating meals together as a family. Um, writing a to-do list and being able to check off the things on your to-do list. Anytime you complete a task, your brain is gonna release dopamine. Or are there some other really small, really good examples? Yeah, anytime you meet a survival need that your brain has, it will also release dopamine, right? So if you're really, really dehydrated or you've been going all day and you've had no water, sitting down and drinking a large glass of water is gonna help release dopamine and regulate stress hormone. It'll regulate that self-control. Emotional processing together as a family will create a lot of really, really positive connection. Um, crying, modeling crying, being vulnerable in that way, super important, super scary. But when we cry, our brain releases a neurochemical called serotonin, which is a mood stabilizer. It decreases the cortisol levels in your body. It regulates the dopamine levels and creates this really, really gentle, uplifting sensation in the body. Because of how much dopamine is released from technology, a lot of our youth's lower brains are really, really strong, which means that their higher brain connections are a little weaker at this age, at this stage, because of COVID and because of the technology we were encouraged to use during COVID. But that also means that their brains are not growing to learn how to recognize their emotional subtleties in your body, right? So when your lower brain activates and you've got a lot of cortisol in your body, your lower brain sends signals to all of your muscles and all of your organs and all of your tissue, your soft tissues that says, hey, we're not safe and we're gonna prepare to fight and we're gonna prepare to freeze. So their muscles are gonna tense up, their palms are gonna get really sweaty, their digestion starts to slow down because when your lower brain activates and your fight, flight, freeze response takes control, all like non-vital organ processes start to shut down and slow. But because a lot of our youth have started growing into adolescence in a societal state of uncertainty, aka COVID, right? They've learned to disconnect from themselves and the sensations and feelings of their body. So a lot of them are unaware of what their bodies start to feel like when they feel stressed or when they feel anxious or when they feel upset or angry. They don't know what it feels like in their bodies. But when you start reintroducing that type of language, like, well, when I get angry, my cheeks turn bright red and my ears get really hot, right? You're going to model that behavior of higher brain self-awareness, which is enhancing the connection to themselves and creates safety for the lower brain. You're going to release dopamine in your brain every time you can name an emotion or a physical sensation that you feel actively in your body. Any kind of self-care will create safety for your body because it's meeting needs that your lower brain has, right? So every time you shower, every time you eat a good meal, every time you physically move your body in a joyful way, like taking a walk or dancing or like if you got really angry, have a good wiggle, right? It's going to release some of that stress and some of that cortisol, and it's going to help you reconnect to the present moment and what you're truly experiencing, which helps reactivate the higher brain and produce small, sustainable amounts of dopamine. What we really don't want here is um, dopamine deficiencies because of social media use. And this is really, this is, this is where science gets a little tricky. So bear with me here. And if you have questions, please ask them. When you play six hours of video games, right? Or I um, binge watch my favorite Netflix show for an entire Saturday, right? My brain is constantly going to be producing dopamine. Now there's this organ in your brain called the insula and it is a shared organ with the higher and the lower brain. Insula is one of the organs that receives the dopamine in our brain and starts processing where it comes from, how we feel as a result of it, right? When your brain is producing large amounts of dopamine consistently for long periods of time, your insula stops receiving the dopamine. It stops translating it into positive feelings and reward. And we enter a dopamine deficiency, a dopamine deficit 
which basically means that to get that same feeling of reward and happiness and pleasure that we got from two hours of a video game, you now have to play it for six hours to get it, which increases the time and the amount that you want to spend with the engagement of technology. Yeah. Um, a couple of my boys are on depression medicine. Mm -hmm. And if you look that up on the internet, it releases dopamine. So mm -hmm. they're using up all their playing video games. So they have to take this depression medicine to level out or what? I'm on? not a mental health professional. Oh. And there's so many subtleties to brain chemistry balance, right? So when you start getting into clinical mental health diagnoses like depression and anxiety, you need to go talk to a, a doctor to make sure that they're aware of your habits, right? What, um, what, where your brain is getting its dopamine from, how often your brain is getting it, um, and how you feel, right? Because a lot of doctors aren't actually putting us through chemical neurological tests or MRI imaging scans. Those are those things are really important, but that's the only very like definitive way of clearly seeing, okay, this is the part of your brain that's activating when you do this. This is how much dopamine you're actually releasing, right? But that's also why we really need to start Don't. enhancing the connection we have to ourselves so that we can feel those subtleties. So when your sons are prescribed different medications, they can give feedback about how it's making them feel. Is it helping? Is it not helping? Don't you think society is just <laughs> drugging the crap out of these kids? <laughs> Uh, truly, I think society drugs the crap out of all human beings, right? Sugar is one of the most addictive substances on the planet, and it is in almost every single processed food, including McDonald's French fries, mm -hmm. including all the bread that we eat, right? So we, even by the food that we eat, are chemically altering our brain's production of dopamine. But the more that we connect with ourselves to feel the difference in our bodies when we eat different foods or when we engage with different humans or when we play different sports or when we listen to different music, right? When we connect with ourselves, when we grow our self-worth, it becomes easier to start identifying when you've experienced positive dopamine versus not positive dopamine. Almost every single youth that I work with one-on-one -on -one who's been referred to me for behavioral disruptions or vaping at schools or um, some kind, you know, whatever it may be, right? And I say, ooh, what do you like to do for fun? And they say video games. And I say, ooh, how do you feel when you play video games? And they're like, well, overall, pretty good. And I'm like, well, tell me more about that. What do you mean by overall? And they're like, well, I like it for the first couple hours, but then I keep playing it. I just start feeling kind of bored. And I kind of just like zone out. And I don't really remember what's happened right? It's that dopamine deficit state that they're entering. But when they're not taught or educated that as soon as you start zoning out or as soon as you start feeling bored, you need to start a new task. Like that's your brain telling you that you've had enough and it's okay to move on. They start relying on the same exact activity, but longer periods of time doing it to receive the same feeling of reward and pleasure. Yeah, just like a drug. Just like a drug. Yep. Yep. So helping your youth become present and aware of their social media use, right? Assessing the role of social media in your life to enhance real connections is one of the best ways to teach them how to use it responsibly, right? If you are coming home from a stressful day after school and you're hopping on your video game and you've got your headset on and you're talking to your friends that you go to school with and you're processing the really stressful test that Mr. H had us take in history today, really positive use of social media because they're still engaging in real time with real people and they're processing through what they experienced in their day with their peers. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as it lasts for an hour to two hours, right? Once we start exceeding the two and a half, three hour mark and longer, we risk dopamine deficit state because of the amount of time that we are solely engaging with one thing, right? But that also includes if a youth is coming home and socially isolating themselves and is not engaging with other people or other friends while they're playing these games. They're zoning out, they're disconnecting from themselves. So unhealthy dopamine includes anything that creates a disconnection or a disassociation from the stress that they're experiencing for longer than an hour. If you are disconnecting from how stressed you are and you're not processing the stress that you're experiencing, your brain learns to rely on easy short-term fixes of dopamine rather than that long-term sustainable release that we look for in genuine real-time connection 
and really understanding why they're making these decisions, right? Are you engaging on TikTok genuinely because you found a new hobby and you're learning how to do this hobby on TikTok? I learned how to bead like um, a daisy ring on TikTok. Like you can learn really cool things to do on TikTok, but that only took me 10 minutes. I don't need to stare at my TikTok for an hour and a half to learn how to do that, right? I have a fully developed prefrontal cortex and can now understand and make these decisions for myself. Our youth do not have fully formed prefrontal cortexes. They have grown up depending on social media for their dopamine release. And so we have to start this re-education process really slowly with them. Because what do you feel when you have your phone with you? And what do you feel when you don't have your phone with you? lost yeah but, that feeling but, is magnitude like just magnified with our youth but how, how do you compete with society and the technology today so at home you can try like heck to you know to not use their social media stuff but then they go out in the world and they're surrounded by it and there's just more and more and more and more and eventually you've got conflict at home because home sucks because they don't ever get to see this stuff but mm -hmm. in the real world they do mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so it's i don't know it just seems like it creates conflict it does it absolutely does in order to raise children intentionally in today's world you will naturally be in conflict mm -hmm. with society yeah. it is just the way of the structure that we live in these days and so every family has to make the decision for themselves how you want to go about doing that right the easiest way is to really limit um, social media use through development, yeah, right? From the, from the beginning. From the very beginning. Because if you yeah. try later on in life, they're going to hate you. Correct. You know? Yep. Yep. I can't tell you how many parents I used to, I used to work um, in uh, Colorado in a resort town and I was a ski instructor. And I can't tell you how many parents I would see who would get home and pick up their kids and just immediately hand them an iPad and not even talk to them about how their ski day was. Your child just spent six hours learning a new task and you're not going to talk to them about their day or talk to them about what they learn or engage with them about how they feel or ask them what they need or share a meal with them. That's creating disconnection, right? Yeah. Social media is a tool to use, like all tools, and it requires restrictions. But we have to be very aware that removing or like removing the social media immediately or enforcing really strong restrictions out of the blue is going to feel like a slap in the face and it's going to really activate the lower brain of your youth because their whole concept of connection to their world stems from their phones it stems from that tablet it stems from those social media platforms and so when you take that away from them they feel disconnected from one of their lifelines and so we have to replace that lifeline with others right um, structure more family visits into your weekend times, right? Structure more decompression conversations in the car rides with them, right? Um, come home and together decide that you're going to maybe spend 30, 40 minutes on your devices decompressing because that's okay and it's what we're used to and it's what we're taught is good and positive. But really limit it to 45 minutes and say, okay, you've had 45 minutes of this type of decompression. You have to go play outside now. You have to go call one of your friends. You have to go for a bike ride. Start training for your sports activity now, right? Um, increase their ability to create an identity for themselves that does not revolve around an online platform. And if there's something that they feel really strongly pulled to that is about online and an identity that they created for themselves, be enthusiastic about that, but bring it into the real world with them. I have one youth who genuinely struggles interacting with people. It is a large cause of lower brain activation. But this youth is so technologically smart and feels so safe working and building games. But then I don't encourage them to play games. I encourage them to talk to their tech teacher and learn how to write code and build games, right? Use your skills in a constructive way that's going to increase your knowledge base. Do you have any questions? Thousands of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like what you, I mean, talked about, you know, I'll say it quite like this, but, you know, we model things and, and model our expectations and how we do things. And I think that as adults, we have to be really careful because it is really easy to get hooked on things. And even though 
I mainly read on my phone, which I think reading is a good thing, but it just looks like I'm on my phone. And, and I was always super careful when my kids were at home about how much time it looked like I was just looking at my phone, even though I was reading my book from the library um, on my phone. Yeah. You know, there's still there's still that modeling mm -hmm. that exists with that. And, you know, if we want to build connection, we have to have connection ourselves as well. So, you know, the grab and go meals that happen in lots of families where you're not sitting down and talking and um, as you said, that asking about the day or or even what is the adult in the household doing, you know, yeah. um, that that all has impact. But it, it is really hard. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. It is really hard. It is. It is. Um, growing our own higher brain self awareness, uh, something that will really help with this type of work with your youth as well. Because the more aware you are of yourself and your actions and your habits, the more you can start noticing and then modeling healthier behavior for your youth, right? As a teenager, I grew up in the start of phones really being a thing, right? Um, and I can't tell you how frustrating it was to sit down at my dinner table as a teenager and have every youth in my home have different rules and regulations about technology use. Or like my dad would say, okay, no phones at the dinner table, but his phone would ring three times and he'd get up and he'd answer it every time, right? That behavior is modeling to me that no technology doesn't really matter, but what really matters is being accessible to whoever is on the line at that time, right? It creates disconnection in the family but it creates connection with technology, right? So we have to start being aware of how our actions are also mirroring and modeling the type of behavior that we want to see from our youth, right? But as an adult, the phone is a necessity. You may have some emergencies or something coming in. I hate, personally, we had a landline when I was growing up and we had 13 channels of TV. So the phone, I hate it. <laughs> but I have a kid that's in college and smart as a whip, straight A's. He's staring at that phone constantly. He's in the car with me. I'm driving. He's staring at his phone. It bugs me so bad. I'm just like, what's going on in the real world? Yeah. So it's, it's different yeah. with every kid, though. Yeah. Really, it really is. Yeah. I mean, it's, he seems to be able to handle it, but does he really know what's going on when you're just staring at your phone all the time? It really bugs me. I have a phone because you have to. Nowadays, you have to have a phone. There's no way to not have a phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do you have a phone? Why do you feel you need it? I have the school calling me for different things. I do foster care. Mm -hmm. I got medical things. I have to order. I have one, one of my boys is diabetic, constantly on the phone trying to get supplies for that. Yeah. Uh, something comes up, emergencies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I also like, like, if, if you need to fix something, there. if you have a problem, I don't care what it is, you can look it up. And somebody else, there's a thousand people out there that have that same problem and they have a solution for it. Yeah. Like fixing things on your car, you can go and step by step. I mean, there's not nothing that I can't fix now because yeah. of the internet. Yeah. It's all bad. No. And it's, that's right. It's not all bad because the phone is a tool. Because technology is a tool, right? A gun is a tool. A gun is not dangerous until you put it into the hands of someone who will turn it to be dangerous, right? Same thing with a phone. A phone is inherently not bad until you start abusing the power of the phone, right? If you communicate with your youth that you have your phone on you all the time, strictly as a tool for safety, right? And you communicate that and you teach them that and you build that connection with them, that's modeling appropriate use. Right? That's explaining to them why. Even with substance use, right? A lot of the youth that come to me because they've been caught at school with a vape, they come in and they're like, well, every adult tells me that vapes are bad, but nobody, nobody will tell me why. Right? And I see my parent vaping, but they tell me that it's bad for me, but I don't know why it's bad for me if I see them do it. Right? So are we communicating the why to our youth? Are we telling them why we have our phones on us? Well, for safety, sweetheart, in case you get into an accident and I need to know about it because I'm responsible for you, right? I'm not pulling out my phone and playing cherry pickers 24 seven, right? I'm checking my phone to see if school called because there was an emergency, because I care about you, because I wanna be there to support you, right? We're having these conversations. And a lot of the time it's gonna be conversations that you're not used to having. 
right? Um, I think I think a lot of us kind of grew up, grew up with the mentality of, well, because I said so. Don't do this because I said so, because I'm the adult and you need to respect me and you need to listen to me and that's what's expected, right? We live in an environment with social media. Our youth no longer live in our households in an isolated way. They are connected to the world in a global way and they can see the, the differences and the unfairnesses that they experience, which are different because of their brain development than the unfairnesses that we experience. But when you start to explain to them why, it helps them learn that technology is a tool. It helps them learn of the dangers of abusing a tool. It helps them learn why it's so important to go outside and move your body, why it's so important to get sunshine, why it's so important to listen to music or journal or take a walk with your friends or be able to talk to someone when you've had a really hard day and encourage that type of engagement, right? Ask your youth if you can support them. And if you can't support them, if they don't wanna to talk to you about something, ask them who they do wanna to talk to. That's okay, you don't wanna to talk to me today about it, that's fine. But you have to talk to someone, who do you wanna to talk to? Who can we connect you with in this moment? Do we need to call grandma? Do we need to call Aunt Linda? Do we need to, do you need to go to the neighbor's house for a minute, right? Can you talk to your guidance counselor tomorrow at school about this? Can I help set up an appointment for you? right? Support them in a way that feels supportive for them. And don't be afraid to ask them what, what they need to feel supported, what they need to de-stress in their life, right? Um, a, lot of, a lot of the um, tension that my youths talk to me about in their home space is a lack of communication and disconnection. There just isn't shared understanding intergenerationally, right? So a parent says, hey, you need to do your chores. You need to start them right now. And in the youth's mind, they have like six other things on a checklist mentally that they want to do before they do their chores. And then their brains get a little disjointed because we're teaching them how to multitask in fairly dysfunctional ways at this point. And so they might start halfway to do a chore and then get really distracted and start doing something else. And then while they're doing something else, the parent's going to remind them to do the chore. But that feels naggy and it feels frustrating and it feels disconnecting and it feels like my parent doesn't trust me to get things done, right? So maybe instead of pointing out something that you see, ask a question about it first, right? Instead of why aren't you doing it? Like, why aren't you doing the dishwasher or the dishwasher is not empty, you know, say, oh, um, do you, do you remember that I asked you to empty the dishwasher earlier? Did you, did you remember that I, did you hear me ask you to empty the dishwasher, right? If they're staring at their phone, it's likely they didn't even hear you. It's likely they didn't even process it mentally, right? Because they're engaged so actively in something that produces so much dopamine, right? We don't need to get angry at them for that because their brains are doing what technology wants their brains to do, but we do need to help support them to do other things. And the healthiest way, the most constructive way to support them to change behavior is genuinely to support them, not to insist on punishments all the time, which is a, a difference in a lot of the way from, from how a lot of us were raised. And it's, it's hard. It's not easy. Like Joanne said, it takes time. Creating healthy, strong pathways in your brain takes time. I don't know if anybody in here has ever tried to quit smoking, but like quitting cold turkey is basically impossible, right? Taking your youth's phone away and telling them they're not allowed to use it for a week is like telling them to quit smoking cold turkey. Suddenly their brains are left with no dopamine and they're in a state of crisis. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to replace that behavior with other behaviors that are going to continue to reward them for it. It's even but worse if, because if that they, person didn't decide to do it. Like if someone decides for themselves, I'm going to go cold turkey, that's something totally different than somebody making them um, do it. So there's that little, yeah. um, there's that little thing too, because, you know, if, if, if somebody decided I'm going to just have a phone, you know, be on a phone diet for, for a week, or I'm not going to look at social media, that's one thing, but for somebody else to take it away, then, then there's all kinds of feelings that get connected with that, that then get connected with all the other things. And then, then you can't build those relationships. In yeah, the same way. it's more stress. It's more cortisol, which causes the lower brain and that survival instinct to fight back to occur, right? But then we're increasing the fight back. We're not increasing the support. 
because Derek says you got to start early because you can set rules for your kids earlier. That it's just our family doesn't use social, doesn't have our electronics during dinner. That's just the rule in our family. Or our rule is that you know your phones go to sleep outside of your bedroom, mm -hmm. and, and that's just the rule. Those are easy, but when you jump in, I feel bad for Bob because he usually jumps in in the middle of a kid's teenage years. Yeah, the yeah, thing, the and, thing and that and I was nothing he can build up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the thing that I was going to mention is like if this kid's never had a phone, you know, or it was controlled, um, he doesn't have it all the time. Then it seems like that addiction isn't quite as bad, like the yeah. video game thing with a couple, like I kind of messed up, you know, a parent learns and we make mistakes oh, yes. constantly. Oh yes. But I kind of learned with my first couple boys, I just kind of, the phone was their phone and they just were on it all the time. Um, but now with the second group of boys that I have, um, they kind of came into the picture without phones. So therefore I control it like no phone while we're eating um they don't take the phone to school um, i might use it the two boys that i have right now are adhd they have all kinds of issues so um like you said it's not all bad i sometimes use the phone on trips because a bored adh kid does damage <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but that's a constructive your... tool, right? Yeah. You're using it in a really constructive way then to meet a need that a neurodivergent youth has, right. and to that's sit, beautiful. Yeah, to sit in a car for an hour or two hours yeah. is a struggle for them. Yeah. So yeah. then they get the phone to play yeah. on, well, yeah. you know, and it really helps. Yeah, totally okay. Yeah. And they probably don't need it during other times then. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. kind of I, I kind of control it with this this group of boys that I have now. I'm trying something different. I'm trying to control the phone a little bit more. Yeah. The first two, like I said, the kid's an A student going to college, but even to this day, if he's in the car riding with me, he's just staring at that phone, mm -hmm. constantly staring at that phone. Yeah. Now, have you ever asked him what he's doing on the phone? Oh, talking to my girlfriend or um, looking up something for, he always has a good excuse because he's a really smart kid, you know? Yeah, that's good. Engage in more conversations about the use of the phone, right? If your youth is sitting on the couch and they've been sitting on the couch for 45 minutes and you've already asked them to do their chores and they're still not listening to you, sit next to them and start a whole conversation. Hey, what are you doing on your phone over there? Well, I'm playing a game. Oh, great. What game are you playing? Well, I'm playing this game. Great. How do you play it? Will you teach me how to play it? <laughs> like, I, do, I do that. I yeah. Do. <laughs> yeah. Like, get annoying about it with your youth. Like, play into that with them because they'll... They'll do a couple of different things, right? One, they could get really excited about the connection and they could absolutely love to bring you into their world and have that opportunity. It's like, oh my gosh, I just got 16 candy grams. Let me show you how I earned them and what that means, right? Or they could get really irritated and frustrated, mm -hmm. but that irritation, that frustration is still going to break the dopamine loop. And then continuing to have a gentle conversation with them about that then creates connection, which will subtly release lower amounts of dopamine. And over time, over long periods of time, you change the patterns in their brain. So it's not an overnight thing by any means. It takes a lot of time. I also, I also, what I do is, like, if they're playing a video game or something, um, and you're cooking something, I always say, like, you know, I'm going to start cooking now. And then, like, so don't start a game because you're going to have to, you know, quit it. Yeah. When it's time to eat. Yeah. So kind of, you know, I kind of give them times and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, well, you got 10 minutes left and it's bedtime, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's good. That kind of stuff. That's good. So Giving them time it. limits will prepare them for when they have to put it down. That's right. Also Instead of just saying, turn it off or I can just shut it off and mm -hmm. then there's going to be a reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I also learned like some kids just certain words set them off like no yeah can i have ice cream instead of saying no i sometimes would say you know that's a really good idea maybe later on we could go to melody and get some ice cream or something yeah instead of saying no yeah so you learn different things it's it's really fun for me it's a challenge but i love that you're gonna get some you're gonna be really creative in how you engage with oh, your yeah. use and technology i, kinda, I know i overthink it. everything the kids <laughs> tell me you, you're overthinking oh, that it's okay that's okay right um, something too to really think about, and this is something that I'm also learning about, right? 
Um, the, Anna Lemke wrote, uh, she's a researcher. She's, uh, I believe she's a psychology PhD. She's a phenomenal writer. Um, she wrote a book called Dopamine Nation, and it talks a lot about this dopamine deficit that technology will put our brains into, right? Um, but there's also new research out there that neurodivergent youth or youth that have experienced trauma and have neurological rewirings in their brain occurring because of the trauma they experience, right, really suffer with intrusive thoughts. And sometimes the technology that they use helps them remove themselves so consciously from those intrusive thoughts and gets them out of their head a little bit, right? Um, in that case, technology right before bed can actually be really soothing for those youths. Even though we've been taught that technology before bed isn't great for your brain and the blue light wakes you up, right? Then you have to get adaptive to what your youth needs and genuinely how to support them, right? And so like getting them blue light blocker glasses will help to decrease the amount of blue light that they're getting before bed and then setting that limit of, okay, you've got for a half an hour to engage with your phone in bed. If you're not asleep in a half an hour because you've still got intrusive thoughts and your brain's still going and it's spinning, I need to come in and I need to talk to you about what you're experiencing and we need to come up with a game plan to support you. We're gonna write down everything that you're thinking in your head, everything that you're worried about and take the time to do that with them. And like, believe me, I know that time is precious and it's highly limited and creating time for these types of conversations in today's society is not something that's supported with work schedules or school schedules or other types of commitments. And it's hard. But just like we have to make time for, for dinner and food and physical fitness and sleep, we also have to make time for connection. We have to show our youth that connecting with them is a priority for us and that we're not just going to let technology assume that role of connection. Concerns, comments. Um, I think video games are actually kind of good for the kids. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like back when I was a kid, we had Pong. Yeah. Pong. Yeah. But now you have to actually think about what you're doing. You know, it's it's way more stuff going on. It's actually for a, a little ADH kid. It it's. I, I see it actually being a good tool for them mm -hmm. as long as it's not too excessive, you know? A hundred percent. And ADHD is a form of neurodivergence, which means that their brain is wired a little differently. So their neurochemicals produce in different amounts, in different orders and are absorbed in different ways. And their brains could really benefit from the different types of engagement and diverse yeah, thinking strategies that video games call for these days right, yeah they have, they have a problem concentrating so mm -hmm. in a video game you have to concentrate you mm -hmm. know on what's going on you know the next so i i do see that as being a benefit for yeah. the kids um i have my computer right in the living room so i can see what's going on you know make sure they're not getting into something they're not supposed mm -hmm. to but yeah. i do see it as a good tool for them yeah, and it is, and it, and if there's nothing else you take away from today, technology is a tool, right? Technology should be used as a tool. It should not be something that we rely upon for every single thing that we need, right? Um, one thing that I really do appreciate from my dad and his use of technology was that if I have a question that he didn't know the answer to, he'd be like, well, we're smart people with smartphones. Let's find the answer together. And he'd pull out his phone and we'd Google it together, yeah, right? Uh, and we'd learn something new together about it. But it was a way that he constructively used technology as a tool for education purposes, right? Um, getting, getting your youth again to talk to you about what they're playing or about how they're engaging, right? Like, oh, one of the saddest things I recently witnessed, I was over um, at a coworker, I was over at a, a, a friend's house who I, my significant other works with um, they have many, many children of a variety of ages, right? So it's hard to give every child the type of attention in the diverse age range and the diverse needs that they all have, right? And this parent was so overwhelmed with their own needs and the needs of the younger children that when their oldest came up and was like, wait, look at my candy car score. Wait, I really want to show you this, right? They just totally dismissed it because they couldn't mentally process having time to look at a, a video game, which in their mind is entirely unimportant, right? But for that child, they were trying so hard to bring their parent into their world and to show their parents something that they were proud of and to, 
to constructively engage and create connection with their parent, right? I, so, I, I see that all the time. Well, yeah. My kids, the two that I have now are, are like, they'll call me over to the computer and say, look at what level I'm at. Look. They want you yeah. to connect with them, they right? Do, yeah. They want that they engagement. Want that they want that pride yeah. and that attention. Yeah, exactly. Because that's going to be the most rewarding type of dopamine that they can get is going to be that genuine connection and that engagement, right? So show interest. Even if you're not interested, like that's okay. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> you gotta, sometimes you gotta fake it. Sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it and like tell your youth that what they're interested in is cool and tell your youth that what they think is neat is neat because that's how their self-worth grows because more than anyone else, they look to their family, they look to their biological connections to get that reinforcement. It's how our brains are wired. It's because of because of the neurochemical oxytocin that our brain releases, right? That happen with our family members and the people that we're in relationships with, the supportive adults that come into our life and fill those roles. That's so vital and it's so important. But without that connection time, we don't have that neurochemical. Oxytocin creates, it's like our love hormone. It creates this really warm, fuzzy feeling of safety and bonding and attachment. It's released in abundance in um, women who biologically like grow and give birth to their child. When you give birth, your brain releases extremely large amounts of oxytocin to bond with your child really quickly, right? Every time we form a relationship with someone, our brain is releasing oxytocin and creating an attachment with them. When you interact with someone that you've bonded with and created an attachment to, our brains release a lot of dopamine and reward us for that. Our insula, that organ that reads the dopamine in our brain, is responsible for producing and reading oxytocin as well. So the larger amounts of dopamine that are released through connection, the easier it is for our brain to read that and then re genuinely receive the reward and the benefit from that neurotransmitter and that neurochemical. Science is crazy. Um, <laughs> I have my, my youngest boy I have right now. Uh, we have a game called Stratega. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you have to hide the flag. And I always thought I was really good at that, but I I haven't. <laughs> I'm trying my hardest, and I cannot beat them at it. Smart, smart kid, right? These, these, man, kids' brains are so plastic. They can grow and learn so fast, so fast. Um, so we can do very efficient technology detoxes in about a two-week period of time, right? Um, if, if, if you're, and you'll really start to notice if your youth is using video games or technology in a constructive way, because when they get that bored feeling, they'll shut it off and they'll choose to go do something else, right? You don't have a problem if that's the case, right? If they're actively feeling bored and they're putting their technology away and they're choosing to engage in something else, it's fine. But it's when they reach that level of boredom and they can't stop that we then have that, that problem. And that's when it might be time for like some kind of intervention where we take the technology away for a week or two and we say hey this is and then we explain it we explain it to the youth we give them the why and we say listen i care about you and i love you and i'm and worried you. about you come and see if you can beat me at strategio <laughs> <laughs> yeah right and then engage them in something else then, let's play a card game let me teach you how to play cribbage let's play scrabble let's Let's do your homework together. Could you teach me about your homework? What are you learning in math this week? Right? Like help have them instruct you or engage you or encourage them to be included in the cooking process when you're cooking dinner. Give them a task and then verbally reward them for that. Hey, I need you to wash the vegetables for me. Yeah, thank you for washing these. That was really important. I'm really grateful that you did that for me. Now we're going to have a really delicious dinner because you helped. It creates a lot of connection. It doesn't seem like it would, but it really does. It really, really does. It also makes life a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, everything. You know, if you're not yeah. so negative all the time, it's, yeah. It, yeah, it just makes it so much more yeah. enjoyable. Just kind of figure things out sometimes, and I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, like, self care for yourselves as well to help you guys de stress your own stress. So that when you have these conversations with your youth, you're not coming to these conversations in a place of stress and lower brain activation for yourself, but you're showing up to these conversations in a place of self-care and self-connection to really model that for your youth. 
right? Hey, I learned that I really needed to sit down in a dark room and listen to my favorite song on repeat for 10 minutes. That's how I calmed down today. Do you think that would be useful for you? Do you want to try that? Do you want to try something else? What do you think would help right now, right? And if they continue to come back with my phone would help me right now, say, I hear that that's how you feel. And unfortunately, the phone is not a tool that is useful in this moment, right? The phone isn't going to help us today. I know it feels like it is, but that's because of the type of reward that your brain gets from your phone. It's not a healthy reward. We need to reward your brain in other healthy ways. Go run around the house three times, and then you tell me if you still want your phone. Have them try it. See what happens, right? Physical exercise, moving your body, one of the best ways to shake up those neurochemicals and start the balancing process for yourself. Even if they're angry, let them punch a pillow, but please, please tell them not to punch trees. I can't tell you how many youth punch things that end up breaking their own hands because they have nowhere else to let it out. And it just is. Or a hole in their wall. Or a hole in their wall. Then they, right? learn, then they learn how to do drywalling. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. They learned a new skill, yeah. right? Cause and effect. So. That's a good one, so too. Yeah. Yeah. Hard. No, right? And then they learn a new skill. And then you can tell them how proud you are of them for learning a new yeah. skill. Good job right? Fixing that hole. Yeah. Good job fixing something that you broke. Look what you can do. It's a lot of work. You don't think you want to make another one, do you? <laughs> right? right. But if they do, now they know what the expectation is. Right. And keep consistent with that. Yeah. That, rep that repetition is also going to teach them cause and effect. And it's going to teach them slow dopamine release. One of my main problems that I have at work with the students that I work with is their parents are texting them at school. Mm -hmm. and so they constantly feel they need to have their phone out so they can answer that text. Yep. Now, it's question. So frustrating. Is that a youth problem or is that a parent problem? Right. It's, a parent. it's a parent problem because the youth has an expectation that they behave for their parent. Mm -hmm. And if they don't respond to that text message in class, what type of repercussions are they getting at home? And it could be a lot worse than what they're getting at school. I'm sorry, I'm guilty of that. I, I, I won't do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's 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 yeah. so hard, right? It's back to yeah. modeling and, and the advice right. to have some good habits and good things. And yeah. For our adults, but for our kids too. Yeah. That's what makes it so dynamic. Yeah. Yep. All right. Do you mind me asking? Are you a teacher, or how do you engage with youth? I'm a special special education assistant at middle school. Well, bless you. Your job is so important. Thank you. Thank yes, you for showing thank up you. for you. Yeah. 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 I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I've done it over 20 years. So. That's phenomenal. Yeah. That's phenomenal, right? But then, like, one of like one of the ways that I've seen teachers pretty effectively kind of deal with that is like. When you walk into their classroom, the expectation is, is that you put your phone in a little sleeve pocket at the front of the room, and it stays in the front of the room until they then come back up and get it at the end of class. But then those teachers leave five minutes at the beginning of class and at the end of class for a youth to check their phone. So the youth has that constructive time to see and respond within an appropriate window for their parents, but it's teaching them that the expectation when you're in class is that you're focused in class. And I'm going to give you the time you need to check your phone and relieve that stress. But now is not the time. Again, delayed gratification. Right. Yeah. They, they do that at the alternative school. Mm -hmm. Kids, when they come into school, they pocket their phones mm -hmm. and they don't get them back till the end of the work. They only go to school for like four or five hours a day. But. Mm -hmm. Yep. When I teach sessions, I have a three strike policy. So I'm a guest lecturer in classrooms as well. Mm -hmm. If I see a youth use their phone once, I let it slide. If I see a youth use their phone a second time, I come over and I gently stand by their desk and I bring notice to it, but I don't address it. And then if I see them use it a third time, I say, okay, you got to go put your phone on the side of the room now until the end of class. Three strikes, you lost it. You know the expectation and you made a choice and this is the end result of your choice. I'm not mad about it, but that's what has to happen now. So you know that happen. at the beginning of your class? Yep, I make an announcement. Yep. I was thinking, yeah. I've done that before. I have, and I've gotten, I've learned a lot of information that I don't want to learn. Some youth are very open, and they will tell me exactly what they're testing and what's going on in their life, and it starts a whole other, a whole other, right? And like, if I'm a parent, I want to know that information about my youth, yeah. right? But if I'm in a classroom with 30 youths, the other 29 youths do not need to know this youth's health concern that they're texting their parent about at that time, right? Not every youth has a filter, right? So I have to be strategic in the classroom in different ways than parents get to be strategic at home. 
but we have to find those spaces and places. And like, none of us are alone in this. We all live in this society. We all experience these frustrations, right? So like, talk to your other parenting friends about it. Have your youth talk to their friends about it. Ask your, like, ask your youth what their best friend's home policy is with phones. Does it align with yours? Is that a conversation you could have with their parents so that you guys can kind of get on the same page and help each other, help your youths? Create connection in your own communities about the change you want to see on a wide scale because that's what really creates positive change. We all need connection, including adults and parents and teachers and administrators and all of the other wonderfully important police officers, all the other roles that we have with our youth, right? We all need that connection and that support as humans because we all deserve that, because we all have self-worth and we all need to feel supported. Like it's just a part of being human as much as our need for water is and sleep and food. We have to help nourish each other's need for connection and oxytocin and dopamine production in really slow, beautiful, healthy ways, right? And encourage that, encourage that in each other. It's important. Thank you for coming. You're welcome.